Let our voices sing and our praises. Hail, hail to the guiding light that brought us tonight to our Savior. the stable feel close to the child so dear cast aside your fear and be thankful hail hail to the newborn king let our voices sing him our praises hail hail to the guiding light that brought us tonight to our savior Good morning, welcome. Thank you to our Praise and Worship Band who's providing the music all morning this morning. Thank you so much, you guys. Uh, welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Advent. It's good to be with you all as we prepare, for, prepare ourselves for the coming Christ child this Christmas. Everything, sorry Emily, that was me. Uh, everything that, that uh, goes along with that in our, in our culture today. It's a busy time of year. So, um, I want to just offer up a few opportunities for you to try to be, you're going to think this is making you more busy, but it's actually making you less busy. Because I'm going to offer a, a few times this week to just gather and take a breath and let go of some of that stuff, the to-do lists, and to be with each other. Um, that's, that's, what, that's what coming together in worship is about. Um, today is the children's program. If you, need, if you are needing some hope for the future, just come at 11.15 today uh, following this service. The, the children won't be coming into worship today. They will be uh, doing their rehearsing um, and preparing for the children's pageant at, at, uh, on the conclusion of this service, so a few minutes after the service. Uh, if you're joining us as a visitor today or online, we welcome you. Thank you for being with us, and we'd love to get to know you. So please be in touch if you would like to, us, to, us to know who you are. We'd love to meet you, whether you're online or in person here. This week, uh, there are some other times to gather. Uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock is the, uh, the celebration of life for Mark Cray and uh, Cindy and Jenny and Will. Uh, we are gathering, they're keeping them in our prayers. Uh, Jenny and Will have come up through our youth program, and Cindy's been a, an amazing youth leader uh, in this church and continues to be. And if, uh, so please be keeping the Cray family in your prayers, and if you can join us tomorrow at 11, you'd be very welcome. On Wednesday is our final Advent Wednesday worship and hold an evening prayer, a dinner beforehand at 530 
Uh, and then following that is the youth Christmas party. Uh, on Thursday, uh, December 19th, is our annual service of healing and remembrance. And for those who have lost loved ones and for whom this time of year is particularly difficult uh, with memories and grieving, that's a wonderful service to come and just be present and light a candle and uh, acknowledge those, those feelings that we have. Today is the final day for poinsettia order for Christmas Eve. Uh, it's $12. You can put it in an envelope, and you can write on the envelope, uh, one of the pew envelopes, who it is in honor of or in memory of, and this, then we'll be happy to order a poinsettia for you. Uh, and finally, just a personal word of thanks in the midst of everything else going on. This congregation has just been incredible, uh, incredibly supportive of this Liberia mission that is coming up, and I just want to give you my personal word of thanks for that. Uh, there's so many people have uh, come up with so many creative fundraising ideas, and you've been hearing all about them for months on end, and I just want to extend my thanks to, to the graciousness of this congregation and the willingness to, to deepen this relationship with Liberia. It's, in, it's changing lives and saving lives, and um, it's making a difference, and this is just one of the many ways that our congregation extends God's love beyond, uh, beyond what we do here in worship. So thank you for that. Um, our final Liberia dinner is tonight. Um, uh, one of our Liberian uh, community people is cooking. If you want to come and sample some food, get a little taste of what we're going to be experiencing over there for the 15 of us who are traveling, um, please join us. It'll be uh, fun for, for everyone of every age, um, including kids. And uh, there is one final... Um, uh, fundraiser thing, we're really close to our goal and we're just looking to close the final gap. Uh, there's a silent auction, um, which you can bid on this morning if you like, that, that uh, Norma spent many hours setting up yesterday. Uh, so that's in the fellowship hall. Um, and then um, we'll be, that'll continue tonight. And there's also uh, continuing to be uh, the script cards available. This is the last day you can purchase those for the Early Learning Center as a fundraiser for our Early Learning Center as well. So again, I would just want to thank you for your support, your generosity. This has been a big lift for us as a congregation, um, and, but I want you to know it really is making a difference. So thank you. I'd like to welcome the Kester family up to uh, lead us into our Advent worship. This Advent season, we are examining and mending our relationships with our neighbors, our families, ourselves, and God. Advent is a season to prepare for a relationship with the incarnate God. As God comes near to us, we are invited to reconcile and repair our relationships. Sometimes it is hard to extend the same compassion to ourselves as we do to our beloved friends. Today, as we light the Advent candles, let us reflect on the relationship we have with ourselves. May the spirit of Advent bring hope and courage. To forgive and love ourselves. Cheers. 
my soul cries out with a joyful shout The God of my heart is great And my spirit sings of the wondrous things That you bring to the ones who wait You fixed your sight on your servant's plight And my weakness you did not spurn so from east to west shall my name be blessed Could the world be about to turn My heart shall sing of the day you bring Let the fires of your justice burn Wipe away all tears for the dawn draws near And the world is about to turn of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Loving God, you come to us with open arms, ready to hold us close. You're already present here with us, even as we look for you. Open our hearts and minds to receive your nearness and grace. May we meet you today in the lighting of the candles, the act of the liturgy, and in the breaking of the bread. Amen. Today's lesson is from Isaiah. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear, here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The, hunt, the haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. 
And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Word of God, word of life. According to Matthew, the 11th chapter. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to Jesus, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. The poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out to the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of woman, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God who loves us, God is, who is with us, and God who is for us. Amen. Well, community, here we are in week three of Advent. And if you're anything like me, you are so behind that you could swear Thanksgiving is happening this Thursday, and there's at least four more weeks until Christmas. When I was a kid, Christmas used to take longer to get here. Advent was a much slower season back then. The weeks dragged on and on, and I'm sure Advent was more than just four weeks in the 80s, right? As a kid, I was fully prepared for the baby Christ child to arrive in that manger by the time of evening, of the evening of December 24th came around. But this year, it's really catching me off guard, and I'm not ready at all. Which I guess puts me in company with some of our characters from the text today. In fact, they aren't even sure who the Messiah is at this point. Even John sends his disciples to, to go find Jesus and ask him, are you the one who is to come, or are we waiting for someone else? And this makes me feel better because John is a prophet who has been telling people that the Messiah is coming. And even he wasn't sure that this Messiah was Jesus. Now Jesus doesn't answer their question directly, but does tell them something compelling. The blind will receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead raised, the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense, me. Why did he have to add that last bit? 
Why did he have to say, blessed is anyone who takes no offense to me? Well, what's implied is that the gospel is offensive. That the Messiah is offensive. He's not merely here with some good news and a hopeful message. He's not just some inspiring teacher who warms our hearts and teaches us how to be nice to one another. No, this Messiah comes onto the scene and shatters the status quo. This Messiah comes and interrupts everything. He disrupts social orders. He destroys the economy. He heals the sick and empowers the oppressed. And we see this disruption because the people who Jesus mentions and lists in this passage are the people who have a certain place, a certain place on the side of the road. To the privileged, there's a certain order to things, especially a certain order about those marginalized by society. This order is important. We who are privileged have this bad habit of assuming well, if there's no blind people, what good is sight? If there are no deaf people, how will the hearing be more superior? If there are no sick people, how will the healthy know how good they've got it? And if there's no one in prison, how do we know that we're free? If the lepers are cleansed and welcomed back into society, what good am I that I have remained clean and untouched by that disease? If the dead don't stay dead, Good Lord, what is real anymore? That's the only guarantee we're supposed to have, death and taxes. And if that wasn't enough, there's this kicker. Jesus says, the poor will have good news brought to them. The poor are not used to good news. The poor get shuffled around from bad landlords to worse landlords. The poor lose their jobs due to company restructuring and layoffs and racism and pregnancy. The poor have more and more health concerns piling on each, on each other, each issue adding more and more complexity to the last. The poor does not get good news. Now, as an intern in seminary, I am tempted to claim to be poor. I certainly feel poor. The government even recognizes my lack of cash flow, and I qualify for income-based student loan payments, which is zero. And it helps in the here and now, but not in the long term, as interest is piling on. And my husband and I have perfected the grad school meal plan, rice and beans. The, the key is to slow cook the beans in a crock pot with an obscene amount of butter, if you're wondering. Put a little bacon fat, too. It's good. But no matter how poor I feel, I'm not actually poor at all. I'm simply broke. I have the hope that this is temporary. I have a backup plan if things get bad. I have a safety net. My cash problem is temporary and directly related to graduate school, which will theoretically lead to a call. But being poor is altogether different. The entire system needs you to stay poor so that the rest of the system can become offensively rich. The poor have to stay poor so that the rich can profit off their misfortune. Think of predatory lending like payday loans, for example. But Jesus says the poor will receive good news. The poor will receive good news. So this is systematically problematic and offensive. Another way of saying this is the poor will receive the gospel. The gospel is for them. And this is offensive to the very class of people who are used to getting the good news. The good news has always been for them. But Jesus says the poor will receive the good news. Because the gospel gives back power to those who are disabled. The gospel gives all people voice and full inclusion in the kingdom of heaven. And this is threatening to the rich, to the able, to the elite, the entire economic system, which is used to having all the power 
and silencing those who they don't want to speak. So Jesus' words are threatening and offensive. If we can't oppress them, how will we know that we are in power? If they're raised up to our level, how do we know who's better? If they are co-leaders with us, how do we know who will have the final say? If we're all equally strong, or worse, if strength is no longer a thing, who will win in this fight? And Jesus answers, exactly, now you're getting it. But I don't think I am, Jesus, because the gospel is disorienting, to say the least. It's infuriating, it's aggravating, it's confusing, and it's offensive. And so, this is Jesus' whole point here when he says, blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. The implication here is I just said some pretty offensive things. So no, we are not ready for Christmas. We are not ready for the Christ child who has been and who is and who will be overthrowing the ways of this world. Last week we heard that a child will lead them and that lions will lie down with the lambs, that there will be no carnage when the carnivore eats with the herbivore. Did you yell out and protest? But a child can't lead them. What does a child know about leadership? Leadership of a kingdom, in the kingdom of heaven, no less. They're too young, they're too impulsive, too unpredictable, too emotional, too vulnerable. So Jesus says again, exactly, now you're getting it. Jesus then, noticing their discomfort as they start to walk away, asks them and the crowds, well, what did you expect when you went to the desert? Did you expect to see a king dressed in fine clothes wandering through the hot sand? No, you went to the desert to find a prophet. So this is what you get. Prophets are not the fancy, honorable, respectable people of society. Prophets are not predictable, orderly, or even clean. Prophets are the ones who are weird, who challenge us, who challenge the status quo, who disrupt the peace, who make everyone feel uncomfortable, who are reluctant to join society, and who just don't fit in. The prophet doesn't want to be there any more than we want the prophet to be there. They go out into the desert to commune with nature and not to burden society by what God has revealed to them. To be clear, a prophet isn't a fortune teller or clairvoyant. A prophet doesn't tell you what the future holds, nor does he have a crystal ball. A prophet tells you about reality. A prophet calls your attention to what you've been ignoring. A prophet in your midst pushes you and says, are you really who you say you are? Do you really believe what you say you believe? A prophet makes us uncomfortable. A prophet's presence is unsettling and upsetting, disorienting. John the Baptist, social outcast, he didn't wear the right clothes, he didn't even eat the right foods. And yet Jesus says, no one is greater than he is. Yet in the kingdom of heaven, the least are even greater than he is. What is the hierarchy in this kingdom, Jesus? Who is the best? Who's the most honorable? Because Jesus, I'm asking this for myself. Where do I fit in? Am I the least or am I the greatest? Do I belong in the kingdom, Jesus? Because it sounds like I don't. Tell me, Jesus, am I important in this kingdom? Do I matter to you? What's my role here? If the people on the side of the road are going to be eating dinner on white linens with the presidents and the CEOs, well, where do I sit at this table? What is the good news here, and is it for me? Because if you're saying I'm guilty of oppression because of my birthright, or the color of my skin, or my luck in the workforce, or because I worked hard, what am I supposed to do now? I never meant to be oppressive. I've been doing my best, God. I'm a good and compassionate person, Jesus. You must see that. So what do you want me to do now, God? How will I know if I matter to you? And God turns to us and says, 
Well, that's the wrong question. What I want you to know is that this type of system is unjust to all who are in it. And the only answer is the kingdom of heaven. A system that marginalizes a few who are blind so that those who can see have power. A system that says, oh, too bad, to someone who's deaf and continues to deny access. A system that says, you're the problem because you're weird. Assimilate to our way of being. This system does no one any favors. This type of system is unjust to all. And so the good news is this. God is here. The kingdom is being created right now in our midst, in this moment, and we are part of it. We get to be co-creators of this kingdom. And all, and I mean all, are welcome in this kingdom. The kingdom promise isn't simply that those who lost their sight will find it, that those who lost their hearing will get it back, that those who are sick will be healed, that the old will be young again. No, the kingdom promise is this. The system that oppresses people because of different abilities, economic and financial statuses, gender, sexuality, race, culture, ethnicity, or anything of the like, this unjust system will be no more. There's a new kingdom being built, and this one is the kingdom of heaven. In this kingdom, all, everyone, every single person is invited. Whatever your economic status, gender identity, sexuality, whether you can see or not see, whether you can walk or roll, whether you can hear or you can sign, whether you're a prophet or a CEO, every single person has a place at this table because this is God's table. In this kingdom, who was believed to be a burden will become a blessing. In this kingdom, those who have been ignored and cast aside will be celebrated and honored. In God's kingdom, all are welcome, and everyone has a place at the table of this heavenly feast. So you, yes you, can boldly approach that table and say, I have a place here, and so do you. And God will respond, yes, exactly. Now you get it. Let's eat. Amen.
you to stand in body or spirit as you are able. Let us confess our holy Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Keeping awake as we watch for Christ and the coming kingdom, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Holy God, we rejoice that your promises take flesh in Jesus. We would ask that you would grant patience to your church as we await the fulfillment of your reign of justice and peace. Give us a growing sense of hope and urgency as we continue to proclaim to you, proclaim you to the world. Lord, in your mercy. God of creation, creator God, we rejoice that you make flowers in the desert, you water the wilderness, you send rain to parched fields and sun to flooded plains. As we journey through this dark winter, We ask that you would nurture all that lies sleeping under frozen ground as it prepares to rise again in the spring. As we face the great challenge of global climate change, give us the will to take every measure to heal our earth. We need your help in this. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, we rejoice in your authority as Prince of Peace. Deliver us from those who wield power through unjust and oppressive ways. Raise up prophets to speak your truth. Protect this great country from all that threatens to tear it apart. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we rejoice today that you dwell in human bodies. Renew signs of your joyful presence in the people of all shapes, sizes, ages, and abilities. Today we pray especially for Dave Merrill, the Dunwoody family, Bob Lundeen, Keith Sen, Jane Kenyon, Joel Wigstad, Jeff Hodling, Gene Nyberg, Ray Jones, Ellie Hansen, Alice Larson, and those we name before you now. We ask that you would give your peace and your comfort to Josh, to Josh Day and his family at the recent loss of his father and for also the recent loss of a good friend. Be with him, comfort him. Lord, in your mercy. Continue to also comfort and be with the Eckegren family at the death of Joyce, whose life and service were celebrated here Friday. Be with Will and Becky Dunwoody and family at the loss of Will's mother, Shirley. Give peace and comfort to the Cray family as they remember Mark, 
and your promises at his memorial service celebrated here tomorrow. Bring peace and comfort to Bill and Florence Head, the loss of Bill's sister, Margaret Hopper. So many losses. Bring healing and power to all who seek you and long for the gifts of your spirit and comfort. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you hear the cries of our hearts. You fill us with hopeful expectation that in each day and hour we may love and serve our neighbors. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us give with joy as we worship God. One with the communion of saints in all times and places, let us come before the living God in confession. Dearest God, you look at us with love and compassion and you marvel at how wonderful and beautiful your creation is, and yet we still hate ourselves. We still point out all of our flaws to ourselves and to each other. Even though you tell us we are fearfully and wonderfully made and that you've reconciled us all to yourself, we still doubt that we could be loved or even lovable. We struggle with the idea that loving ourselves is selfish, but we want to acknowledge that what you made is good. God, forgive us for our self-hatred and teach us your ways of compassion. Amen. Beloved children of the Most High, you are gathered before the righteous judge who has mercy on all. Splash exuberantly in the waters of baptism where sin is washed away in the river of life. Dwell peacefully in the loving arms of the one who nurtures all creation. Go forth boldly in the assurance that your sins are forgiven. In the name of the one who is coming and who is already here, Jesus Christ, our Savior. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it to all to drink. 
saying this cup is the new covenant, the new life in my blood which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All are welcome at this table in which Christ's grace, love, his own body and blood are given for all of us. Uh, If you are communing with us for the first time, please know you are welcome here. Uh, There is a place for you at this table. And following communion today, there will be prayers of healing offered at either side of the altar if you have carrying someone on your heart today or for yourself for whom you would like prayers. The feast is prepared. All are welcome. Please come.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you now and keep you forever in his grace. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that we, each one, are welcomed at your table without exception. Strengthen us by the power of your Holy Spirit through your word, through the sacrament, and through the love that we feel from and through one another. Strengthen us to go out and let everyone else know that they are beloved as well in any way that we are called to do so. We do this in your name and by your power alone, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and receive the blessing. Before we do, there is coffee, treats, fellowship available. You've got about five minutes. Take a little breath and then come back in for the children's program. There's also a silent auction going on. Oh, there is, yeah. I mean, if you hit that on the way to your coffee, that's fine. Silent but. auction, and I, I just, we had this idea that we would all of us pull together and bid on the drum set and give it to Arthur's children for Christmas. What do we think about this? Whatever is bid on the drum set, we will match it and give it back to you. <laughs> and please stop by and visit Barb from the Early Learning Center who's here this morning as well. Now let us receive the blessing. May God who gathers us in love lead you in pathways of righteousness and justice. May God who knows us more deeply than we know ourselves lead you in pathways of forgiveness and freedom. And may God who fills us with good things lead you in pathways of equity and abundance. And the blessing of the Holy Trinity, one God, be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs> Hey.
that can clap on the offbeat. Oh, praise the Lord. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Someone shouting from the desert. Someone shouting from the sea. Someone shouting from the mountain. Someone shouting from the valley. I am young and I am cold. Some are shouting from the country. I am lonely, I am old. Shouting, come and change me. Someone shouting, save my soul. Leave the mics. Uh,